Today I'm here to talk to you about back pain, or is it? Because sometimes you'll have pain in the back that has a mechanical cause, and sometimes you'll have pain in the back that can cause a neurologic pain, or that can cause referred pain to other areas of the body. The objectives of this lecture, review, hopefully, or learn anatomy, gain a better understanding of diagnosis and treatment of common back injuries, diseases, and conditions, and lastly, and probably most importantly, to be able to distinguish between the following conditions. Myelopathy, radiculopathy, neuropathy, mechanical back pain, and lastly, factitious pain disorders. Quick review of anatomy, cervical spine, seven vertebrae, top of the spine is more about rotation, and the lower part of the cervical spine is more about extension and flexion. Thoracic spine, 12 vertebrae, because of the rib cage being attached to it, it's pretty stable, not a lot of motion through the thoracic spine. The lumbar spine, um, five vertebrae, usually some people can have six lumbar vertebrae depending on their lumbosacral junction and anatomy. Um, again, mostly flexion and extension through the lumbar spine. And then lastly, the sacrum. The intervertebral disc um, is basically comprised of two different types of fibers, the annulus fibrosus, which is the outer fibrous ring, and the nucleus pulposus, which is sort of softer. So when someone has a disc herniation, it's because the annulus tears and the nucleus pulposus extrudes. And depending on where it extrudes, affects what it compresses and what the symptoms are. Spine alignment. The cervical spine is generally lordotic. If someone has um, any kind of condition causing pain, which will cause their cervical muscles to tighten, then the cervical spine will appear flat. The thoracic spine is generally kyphotic, curved like this, and the lumbar spine is typically lordotic. Same kind of thing. Any kind of muscle spasm or pain or abnormal process can cause the lordotic portions of the spine, the cervical spine and lumbar spine to flatten out. Upper motor neuron signs. So we'll just kind of start from the top down. The, that means the lesion is above the anterior horn cell. So it can be in the spinal cord, brainstem, or motor cortex. So when someone has an upper motor neuron lesion, I'll speak really slowly for those of you who want to speed this up later because this might be testable information. Um, increased muscle tone spasticity, which translates into being hyperreflexic. Um, weakness, generally the flexors are weaker than the extensors in the legs and the reverse in the arms. And increased deep tendon reflexes, as well as abnormal signs. In the foot, there'll be a Babinski sign and, uh, and clonus. On the hand, that would be a Hoffman sign. Again, we'll go into those in a little more detail later, but just up, once again, upper motor neuron. Increased muscle tone, weakness, hyperreflexia, and abnormal signs of cord compression. Again, the, you can further localize this depending on where the cord is compressed. A cord lesion can also cause sphincter symptoms, a sensory level and a dermatomal pattern, and bilateral motor signs. A brainstem lesion can cause disruption of higher functions, dysarthria, dysphagia, Horner syndrome, cerebellar signs, and spinal thalamic sensory loss, which is actually hard to say quickly, but I seem to have pulled it off. Um, a lesion of the motor cortex, so again, the high, as we go higher up to the brain, is associated with frontal signs, dysphagia, hemianopia, and disturbance of sensory function. This is a sagittal MRI. Um, showing basically the, the gray part in the middle is the spinal cord. The white stuff around it is spinal fluid. On, the, on this part of the slide, we see the vertebrae and the area between the vertebrae are the intervertebral discs. In this case, this would be considered a fairly narrow spinal canal and the discs at these levels here are protruding into the spinal canal causing cord compression. How can I tell it's cord compression? Because the signal in the cord at the level where it's compressed is different than the signal in the cord in other places. And that's sort of how it works with MRI because MRI, you know, different tissues have different characteristics depending on how fast or how slowly you're spinning the magnet. 
And so if tissue has a different look on MRI, then that's usually pathologic. So if you have a cord compression and the cord usually looks gray and you have an MRI section which highlights fluid, then the cord where it's compressed will look a little whiter because there's more of a fluid intensity to it. That's not gonna be something that's on the test. So this is a post-operative radiograph of someone who had um, a, a significant compression of their spine with narrowing of the canal, much like the person who we, who we saw in the previous slide with basically stenosis at multiple levels, a very narrow canal, protruding discs. And so when you decompress the canal, sometimes you render it unstable. So you can't simply just decompress the cord and decompress the nerve roots. In this case, if you have to do a wider decompression, you have to stabilize it. In this case, it's stabilized with two rods and screws so that the canal is open and now stable. Sometimes you have to go to the front and back of the spine to stabilize. In this case, they have a plate on the front of the spine stabilizing and rods and screws on the back. This is someone who had basically instability between the skull and the cervical spine. So then you have to fuse the skull to the cervical spine, which pretty much eliminates rotation and is something you would do as a last resort. This is a common condition causing stenosis. This is ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament or OPLL. Again, this won't be on the test, but any condition that takes up space where the cord or nerves are supposed to be can cause and usually does cause neurologic symptoms. When you have ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, it's in the center of the canal, so it compresses the cord. When you have lesions that are on the sides of the canal, it's more likely to compress a nerve root. And this just shows a uh, one level discectomy infusion um, with, that will be done if someone had a herniated disc with some potential instability. This is another slide of someone with ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. As you can see, if that whole ligament ossifies, it takes up a lot of the canal and can cause severe stenosis. And because it's compressing the spinal cord, causing cord symptoms or myelopathy. This is someone who had ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. In this case, you just cut the lamina on one side and then completely, and then cut the lamina on the other side partially and then swing the entire back of the spine open like a door. And this is called, because we're very, very creative with names, an open door laminoplasty, where one side of the lamina is a hinge and the other side is the door. And you just open up the entire back of the spine to create more room for the cord. Okay, so that, that kind of concludes the upper motor neuron things that are caused um, that it would include myelopathy and anything higher up. So just a quick review, upper motor neuron, anything at the level of the um, upper motor neuron or above that. Now we're getting into lower motor neuron signs. So this can either be in the anterior horn cell or distal to the anterior horn cell. And these findings are very different. This could be basically at the level of the nerve root it can be at the level of the brachial plexus. It can be at the level of a peripheral nerve. When you have a lower motor neuron compression, you have decreased muscle tone. So just the opposite of upper motor neuron signs. Weakness and wasting. Both these conditions can have weakness and muscle loss over time. And the difference here is areflexia. When you have an upper motor neuron lesion, you have hyperreflexia. When you have a lower motor neuron lesion, you have areflexia. Once again, for those of you speeding it up, anytime you see a condition with three or four features, that generally lends itself to a test question. No hints. Cauda equina syndrome. Cauda equina syndrome is acute compression of the cauda equina, which is how it got its very clever name. Um, this is when you get a compression, but below the level of the cord, at the level of the cauda equina, so below L1, L2. Um, causes our acute disc herniation, so lower in the lumbar spine, um, or any kind of acute space occupying lesion. So if you had a tumor and you had a bleed from the tumor, or if you had an infection, and the symptoms are usually abrupt and severe. Anytime the body has a change that occurs slowly over time, in general, the symptoms aren't abrupt. Cauda equina tends to be abrupt, like a big disc herniation, 
big infection, big bleed, causing acute neurologic issues consisting of severe pain, numbness, altered gait, in some cases urinary retention, and sexual dysfunction. This is an emergent condition. Workup can generally be inferred from what the accompanying symptoms are and signs are. So if someone presents with back pain going down their leg, you're like, okay, that's probably, that's sciatica, probably a nerve root compression. If someone has weakness of their biceps with the absence of a biceps reflex, um, you know, if they, if they don't have any kind of upper motor neuron signs like no Babinski or Hoffman sign, then it's probably a lower motor neuron, so at the level of nerve root or distal. And if they have spasticity distally, like in the legs, then you would think that's probably something that's higher. Weakness of thumb abduction, wasting of the thenar em eminence, numbness of the thumb, index, middle, and half of the ring finger, that's when you get to a peripheral lesion. That would be distal median nerve, which would be the findings you'd have in carpal tunnel syndrome. So you always kind of work either from the lesion backwards or centrally distally to determine where the lesion actually is based on what your knowledge is of what it is innervated by what. So in the case of like carpal tunnel syndrome, if someone has exclusively median nerve findings in branches of the median nerve that are distal to the wrist, that would make sense. Workup is basically starts with a careful history. Usually in terms of your history and physical examination, you're gonna have a pretty good idea of what's going on if you take a good history and your physical examination will be done mostly to confirm what you think based on the history, not as like a further, you know, trying to figure out what it is. Um, the careful history should be followed by comprehensive physical examination. So even if I see someone coming in complaining of numbness in their hand, I'm still gonna examine the cervical spine. I'm gonna see what kind of maneuvers irritate them. Um, if someone's got a low back problem, I'm gonna evaluate their hip. Again, you wanna make a distinction between when someone has pain, if it's mechanical, just from a joint, or if it's of a neurologic origin and the pain is just referred to the joint, but not indicative of pathology in the joint. Um, followed by a careful neurologic examination. At that point, I'll determine whether I need diagnostic studies. In general, you really shouldn't order a diagnostic study unless it's going to change what you might do. If it gets you to a point on your decision tree, like if the MRI shows this, I'm gonna do that. If it shows something else, I'm gonna proceed differently. If the diagnostic test is not going to change what you're going to do clinically, it probably is not a necessary test. Um, and then once you've done, done your whole history, physical, gotten whatever diagnostic studies you feel you needed, then it, that's the point where you'd make a differential diagnosis and then proceeding from most likely to least likely and form a treatment plan. I think one of the biggest things you run into clinically, if you make a decision too quickly without reviewing all the facts, then you sort of close yourself off to other possibilities and that's when things get missed. That's why you have to develop a routine to your history a routine to your physical, a routine for how you look at an x-ray, a routine for how you look at lab tests because you wanna make sure that you do things the same way every time and that you have a routine. Because otherwise, if you focus on something too early, your mind kinda of closes off and you may miss something. Um, things that don't seem to make sense, usually don't make sense for a reason. I think that's when we get into like factitious pain disorders. You wanna make sure that whatever's wrong with the patient in terms of their history and whatever you've established on your physical examination and diagnostic studies makes sense based on the anatomy. If, if someone has a non-anatomical pain distribution, then maybe there's a factitious element to their pain. Again, factitious pain disorders are a diagnosis of exclusion after you've gone through everything else. And be careful of the patient who kind of acts in a little bit of a, what you would consider a sketchy manner because people who act sketchy still have real pathology. So you don't want to really discount. You still want to take a good history. You want to take the time to listen to people. You want to do a good physical examination. And again, make sure that the story kind of makes sense, that the story corresponds with the injury, and that the physical examination makes sense anatomically. Lastly, if you follow these careful steps, 60% of the time it will work every time. Myelopathy, again, just a quick review of some concepts. Spinal cord compression, primarily upper motor neuron lesion, 
Cervical myelopathy usually presents as a heavy feeling in the leg, poor or legs if you have to, which most people you know seem to. Um, poor exercise tolerance, radiculopathy, poor fine motor skills, laramides phenomenon, which is intermittent electric shocking sensations in the limbs that's exacerbated by neck flexion, numbness and tingling in the limbs. Now with any neurologic problem. When you compress that structure, you can recreate the symptoms. So whether it's a myelopathy or a neuropathy, a lot of your things you do on physical examination are to replicate what happens to the patient when they're experiencing their maximal symptoms. In terms of being nice, you don't want to do it over and over again. You want to save the noxious part of your physical examination for the end of the physical examination. And if you have a pain producing maneuver, you don't want to keep repeating it because, huh, that's kind of cool. No, you want to just do it once and at the end. Um, so examination findings in myelopathy. The weakness is more severe in the upper limbs. Gait is usually affected with a myelopathy, and so people will use kind of an ataxic, sort of broad-based gait. Um, one of the key features of myelopathy is increased resting, rest, uh, increased resting muscle tone and hyperreflexia. As far as like then the pathologic signs, which are the last couple things on here, um, ankle clonus. So when you take the foot and, for, and forcefully dorsiflex it. Again, if you're gonna do something noxious, tell the patient before you do it. I'm gonna lift your foot up, it's gonna be kind of uncomfortable. If the foot twitches around, that's clonus. Babinski sign, scratch the bottom of the foot, the big toe points up. Again, that's a sign of, of a myelopathy or upper motor neuron lesion. Um, Hoffman's reflex, flick the terminal aspect of the middle or ring finger and it will cause the other fingers to flex. So you'll flick the finger and the other fingers will flex. That's a positive Hoffman sign. All these things, I know I said it already, make sure to tell the patients you're gonna do something that's gonna be uncomfortable before you do it. Explain to them what it is so you don't surprise them. Um, the finger escape sign is not when one of your fingers actually escapes. It's just when the small finger spontaneously abducts because you have weak intrinsic muscles. It's got a couple other names too, but again, it's not really germane for what we're talking about now. Um, this is the hand escape sign, which is totally, totally different. That only occurs in the Adams family, which is a dated cultural reference. Uh, this just shows the Hoffman test um, in the upper portion, uh, upper left portion of the slide, where you flick the DIP joint and it causes the other fingers to flex when it's positive. This shows the Babinski, where you scratch the bottom of the foot and a, a normally the big toe should flex um, when it extends. That's an indicative of um, upper motor neuron lesions. Here are the things that can cause a myelopathy. Disc herniation. Now this, this herniation is tricky because again, if it's near the center of the canal, it can compress the cords. If it's near the periphery or lateral portions of the spinal canal, it can hit the nerve root and not affect the spinal cord. So you can have a disc herniation that can cause both a myelopathy, cord compression, or a radiculopathy, a nerve root compression. Um, People can have congenital things that will cause myelopathy, anomalies within the spinal canal, um, spon spondylosis. People can have post-traumatic myelopathy. Um, as we also pointed out, anything that occupies space, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, which I've said a couple times, and tumors. Radiculopathy, this is a nerve root compression. Lower motor neuron findings, again, this is one of those things which is kind of easy to write a test question on. If you don't get these hints, then I, I, I can't help you. Um, weaknesses, weakness rather, diminished reflexes, no spasticity, and irritation when you stretch the affected nerve. So in this case, they're demonstrating a straight leg raise in someone who might have a herniated disc in the lumbar spine. So you have weakness, deep, deep, uh, diminished deep tendon reflexes, low muscle tone, so no spasticity. This is a cross-sectional anatomy. This is what I'm talking about. This shows a tear in the annulus fibrosis with the nucleus pulposus protruding. In this case, it's pressing on a nerve root, which would cause a radicular sign or a lower motor neuron. If it was pressing on the cord, it could cause an upper motor neuron type clinical picture. If it was pressing on the cauda equina, lower down, below, you know, in the lower portion of the lumbar spine, then it could cause cauda equina syndrome. Um, I think we'll just save the, uh, the clinical cases for our, our group session. And so that's, that's all I've got right now about back pain. Hope it wasn't too painful.